How is it possible that a multi-billion dollar company was susceptible to a hack which accessed some of the largest accounts on their platform, generating over $100,000 in just a few hours for the hackers that are behind it? And what can you learn from this scenario to ensure that all of the apps and projects you build do not fall for the same type of security vulnerability? In this video, I'm going to be covering all of that and so much more, so make sure you stick around till the end. Do you want to work with real developers, building real projects for real problems, all while competing for $10,000 in prizes? I mean, duh, this sounds amazing. And luckily, Auth0, which is an amazing security and authentication company, is hosting their first ever hackathon from August 7th to August 9th, where you can work with other developers to build real solutions to real problems. So not only are you getting get tons of real world experience working with teams of people, but also you're going to be competing for $10,000 in prizes. This is a win-win all around, so make sure you check out the link down in the description below to find out how to sign up now. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one. Now in this video, I wanna talk about the very recent Twitter hack that happened where a ton of different high profile, large follower account accounts were hacked and they sent out essentially the very same message to all of these different accounts. They all sent out a message that essentially said, send us some Bitcoin to this address and we'll send you back double whatever you send us. So give us a dollar and we'll give you $2. Now this is a fairly obvious scam for most people, but a lot of people fell for this. And in just the few hours that the scam was up, the hackers generated over $100,000 to this Bitcoin address. And I don't want to talk about the actual scam itself and the people that fell for it because just because you fell for this scam does not mean that you're a dumb person or anything like that. People are in desperate situations or they're just looking for, you know, a quick dollar. It's like playing the lottery, essentially. Maybe it's true. You know, Mr. Beast's account got hacked and he's a very philanthropist person. So it's very, you know, easy to think that he might actually do something like this. So falling for the scam doesn't necessarily make you a bad or dumb person. And I don't want to talk about that at all. What I want to talk about is the actual security itself. How exactly did this happen? Because Twitter is a massive company. I mean, they spend millions of dollars a year on development and security to ensure that there are no security flaws in their application at all. Yet this massive security hole was you know, accessed and tons of different accounts were compromised and hundreds of thousands of dollars of innocent people were stolen essentially. So how did this happen? Well, normally when you think of these types of security flaws, you think of, you know, the common big ones like cross-site scripting or SQL injection or some other type of flaw in the actual code of Twitter itself. But in reality, most hacks that happen don't happen because the code is flawed. It happens because of something called social engineering. And social engineering is essentially the act of impersonating someone else and trying to get information or access to something that that person would have that you wouldn't normally have and then using that access for nefarious purposes like posting you know, on other people's accounts and trying to get money from people. And this social engineering type of hack is exactly what happened to Twitter. Essentially, someone tried to impersonate another person to get access to different accounts on Twitter. And one way that you could do this, which is very easy to think about, is maybe you forgot your password. So you call up Twitter and say, hey, I forgot my password. You know, my name is Jeff Bezos. I forgot my password. Can you give me my password so I can log in? Now, obviously, it's really hard to try to impersonate someone to get your password because this is something that, you know, it's pretty much impossible to prove that that's Jess Bezos on the phone and not, you know, me, Kyle. So they don't really do password authentication over phone like that, which is why you generally have email or some other system to do that. But what these hackers did is they accessed something actually much, much more dangerous than a password. They accessed an internal tool inside of Twitter, which allows you access to every single account on Twitter, literally any account you want. You can access through this development tool inside of Twitter and you can do anything. You can post, delete, essentially whatever you want. It's as if you had that account yourself. And with this new power, this tool that is inside of Twitter, these hackers were able to compromise tons of different accounts, very high profile, high follower account accounts, and post out this scam that tons and tons of people unfortunately fell for before Twitter was able to take it down just a few hours later. So while many of us think of a hacker as someone frantically typing on a keyboard trying to get through the firewall to access the mainframe like you see in every single you know cheesy TV show, really, in reality, most hacking is not actually done through the computer. It's done through this type of social engineering, where the best skill that you can have as a hacker 
is not technical ability, but it's actually people skills. Because the more convincing and persuasive you are, the more likely you're going to get access to these development tools or passwords or whatever else you're trying to get access to. So most likely the way that this hack went down is the hacker called up you know, someone in Twitter and probably pretended to be either an employee or some form of contractor working for Twitter. And they were saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to troubleshoot a problem with a customer. I need access to these dev tools because I need to be able to, you know, impersonate them to figure out what the problem was. And I lost access. I don't have it on my computer anymore or something like that. I don't have access. I forgot my password. Can you hook me up with these dev tools so I can help assist this customer? And more than likely, the person they called was like, no, I can't do that. You know, I don't have permission to do that. You know, we aren't allowed to do that. And they hung up or they sent them off to someone else. But if you just try over and over and over again, you're going to get a new person every time on the phone, a new employee of Twitter. And eventually someone is going to say, oh, that makes sense. I believe you. And they're going to say, here's access to this thing that you're trying to get. Here is these development tools that you can use to access any account that you want. And now with just one simple phone call, you now have access to every single account on Twitter. And that is a huge problem. I mean, just the existence of this development tool, which allows you to impersonate anyone on Twitter, is already a problem because that is so much power. I mean, as Spider-Man taught us, great power comes with great responsibility, and having the power to control any Twitter account is pretty much like God power over Twitter. So having access to this be so easy to obtain by some social engineering hack is a massive problem on Twitter's part, and they need to do a really good job of making sure they up their security, not in the code, but in the actual people that work there, to make sure they have good security practices to ensure that this type of program does not leave control of Twitter. And more importantly, this program should probably be restricted in the things that it can do, to make it so that it's not as easy for a hacker to use this to be able to post out tweets on other accounts and things like that. On top of that, this tool should definitely be locked down more. The fact that they were able to get this through their social engineering, whether it's through a phone call, in-person meetings, whatever it was, the fact that this was so readily available to them is a massive problem. This should be locked down super securely, especially with how much power this program has. It should be only available for very certain, very select, high security clearance people to access. I mean, we're talking like top level secret service CIA level kind of security clearance to access this kind of stuff. Like you need to be the security person at Twitter to have access and no one else does. Now, a lot of people are talking about this development tool and saying that it is a terrible thing and that Twitter should never have this development tool because anybody could just impersonate anyone and it's a terrible idea. And while there is some truth to that where this development tool is a bad thing because it could lead to problems like this, in general, having a development tool like this is actually really helpful for developers and support teams because they can easily figure out what a problem is. Let's say there's a bug that happened. You can impersonate a user in order to figure out exactly what the bug was if it was unique to that individual user. Or if you're a support team member, you can maybe impersonate someone to see exactly what they're seeing to figure out what the problem they're running into is to try to help walk them through the problem or even just solve the problem for them. So having that ability is really useful when you're coming to support and development and trying to fix bugs. But again, it is a massive security hole, which is why it needs to be locked down or more restricted. In general, if you're going to have this type of security level access on a production server environment like the actual Twitter.com, it needs to either be locked down or just not available at all on production. Generally, these development tools are things that you use in development, so while you're working on the code, or they're going to be used on like a staging environment where it's a little bit harder to impersonate someone by just changing some fields in the database because staging is a little bit more like production, more locked down. So having these development tools for staging makes it easy to test the code before it goes to the real twitter.com. I've actually worked on projects before where there was this God mode level development tool which let you impersonate any user, but it was only available on the staging environment. We didn't push this out to production so that anybody could access this. In general, it was only available on these test and staging and development environments to make testing your code easier before you actually push it up to the live, you know, twitter.com, for example. So we know how this hack occurred, but what can you learn from this? I mean, what can you take away from this hack in order to make sure you don't have this problem occur on your own project? The very first and most obvious solution is just don't have this type of tool. Don't have a God mode dev tool that can access any user account, impersonate anyone and do anything because that opens you up to security loopholes. 
anytime that you have great power, you have this security concern that that power could be misused. If you have direct access to a database, then you have concerns with people being able to access that database with malicious intent. Having this God mode tool is essentially the same as being able to access the database. It's a great power that you need to keep locked down. So the easiest way to avoid it is just don't do it. Don't build it, don't have it, don't use it at all. Or if you do need this or have it, don't push it out to a production environment. Only keep it in development or staging or test or something else that's not in production. Now, the second thing that we can learn from this has nothing to do with the dev tool at all, but has everything to do with how you can prevent social engineering attacks. Because like I said, almost all hacks that occur nowadays are related to social engineering because we spend tons of money on building secure applications where the code is flawless. There's no security flaws at all in the code, but people, humans are flawed. And it's easy to find one human out of the thousands and thousands that work at a company, which will eventually believe you when you tell them something. And then there you go, you're into the company and that's all that you needed. So having ways to set up essentially fail safes or essentially security level access where you need to access not only one random person inside of Twitter, but you need to access the right individual that has that security clearance. That will help at least mitigate social engineering attacks because now instead of just being able to get to any random employee, you know, just a sales rep, you now need to get to the actual security person that has access to the thing that you want, whether it be a password, a dev tool, or something else. Also, what you need to do is train your employees. Whether you are owning a company and running a company or you're an employee of a company, you need to advocate for some way to train the employees of the company to understand these different types of security flaws and the different types of social engineering. One of the easiest ways to do that is just to send out bogus emails to a bunch of your different employees at your company. And if they you know, click on a fishy link or open this email, essentially send them an email that looks like it comes from the company they're inside of, but is actually a malicious email. And you can tell just by kind of looking at it that it looks fishy and you know malicious. But if these people click on these links or they open these things up, they divulge information that they shouldn't, that's a great indicator that you have a security hole inside of the people working for you and not necessarily in the code or the product that you built. So this is some easy way to figure out if you have that flaw and then how to fix it. I mean, this is something that people do with code all the time. They hire essentially hackers and these hackers will go through and try to hack a product. Purposely, the company will pay them to hack their own product just to make sure that they covered all the different security flaws that are available. And then if the hacker finds a security flaw, they can then work with the team to fix it. It's the same thing with these social engineering hacks. You need to essentially socially engineer and hack your own organization by doing the, your own social engineering hacks. And then where you find the holes, you need to plug those holes, fix those problems and address them where they are. You can do this with different types of training. You can do it by just going over, you know, different briefs and different situations to try to make aware everyone of the different types of social engineering hacks. Essentially, you just need to educate the employees of your company to understand how they could be affected and how they could be hacked in this type of environment. I'm just hoping that with this very public, large hack of Twitter, that it opens the eyes of a lot of other companies to realize, hey, maybe we aren't doing things exactly as we should, and maybe we're vulnerable to these social engineering hacks. And it'll make them want to secure themselves against these hacks, and hopefully overall, the entire world will become more secure as a result of this one-off hack. That is what I really hope for. And I hope that you can help with this by taking the different lessons that I taught in this video and the different lessons from Twitter's mistake and try to incorporate them in your own projects, in your own companies, in your own places of work. With that said, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, you can check out some of my other security related videos. I'll have them linked over here and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.